Good morning. Last week, we explored how God often takes our own strivings for achievement and success and finds ways to humble us through circumstances, disappointments, and even suffering so that our confidence comes to rest on Jesus. God is at work to reorient our profiles, priorities excuse me, so that we see what is most important to him. We call this the great reversal. Today we're going to talk about God's method for bringing forth the goals and desires he has for our lives. Not surprisingly, when we learn to cooperate with what he is doing, God will take us on a grand adventure. He wants us to come to the place where we can fully acknowledge that he is a source of our growth and good works. We can call this the great pursuit. Listen to the Apostle Paul as he describes his passion in life now that he fully understands God's call. I'll be reading from Philippians chapter 3 in the New International Version. Please open your Bibles or read along in the bulletin. Philippians chapter 3 verses 12 through 16. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then, who are mature should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Thanks, Carol. Several months ago, at the end of March, I went on the most remarkable field trip. My middle school daughter, had been invited to a service day taking place at Key Arena with 14,000 other middle school and high school students. And I, I had heard about this, and I thought, that sounds really interesting. I love the idea of service and, and action and those kinds of things, and I was wondering, how could I get on the bus <laughs> to see this thing? Could I volunteer to be a chaperone? Well, my, my wife works at the middle school, and I, uh, so she talked to the teacher, and the teacher said, there's no way you can go. It's full. There's 14,000 students all going. There's, there's no more room. There's no more tickets. But if somebody doesn't show up at 3 in the morning when we get on the bus, you can go as a chaperone. So I, I got up that morning really early, drove my daughter to the bus, and thinking, who knows what's going to happen today? Turns out one of the kids didn't come. So I hopped on the bus, became the chaperone, and landed at Seattle Key Arena, where movie stars were present. We had Martin Sheen, Jennifer Hudson, Magic Johnson, the governor was there, Steve Ballmer, head of, uh, CEO of Microsoft was there, all giving motivational speeches to these young kids about how they could impact the world. And the causes were good ones. It was poverty, it was uh, human trafficking, orphans, uh, all kinds of, of great causes. And the theme of the day really was to find something greater than yourself and participate in it. Uh, find something of meaning to you and do it. And I, I think that's not a, a bad thing, actually. If anybody saw Time Magazine uh, this last week, on the cover of Time Magazine, there's a picture of a young kid uh, with their cell phone taking pictures of themselves and posting the pictures on the Internet. Uh, and the idea was that we are a narcissistic culture, and me, me, me was the title of the, of the uh, Time Magazine cover. The whole theme of this event was to help kids see bigger than that. It was, in fact, they said, we're going to go from me to we. And what this day was is called We Day. It's that we're together going to make a difference. We're going to make, the, make a change in the world. Now, as this was going on, I was listening carefully to see what they were using to motivate the kids and how it was going. And one of the teachers who had gone on the trip, she knew I was a pastor. She was kind of wondering what I thought about all this, of course. So she whispered to me and she said, you know, it'd be nice if God was in the mix a little bit more here. You know, because a few of the speakers, they had um, 
spiritual motivation. Others clearly just were doing it for good deeds alone. And uh, just as that was happening, up came Martin Luther King III, who's the son of Martin Luther King Jr. Now, we were in the, in the nosebleed seats. We're way back, up on the top, looking down, and I had my little binoculars with me. And I could see the teleprompter through the whole morning as this thing went on. And everything was scripted, man, way scripted. Well, Martin Luther King III gets up and that teleprompter went off. There was no teleprompter. I thought, wow, what's going to happen now? <laughs> and he, he introduced himself as a pastor and I went, wow, what's going to happen now? <laughs> and as he spoke, he did speak about God and about leading. And I thought, ah, there we go. I've been waiting for this all morning. So glad they actually included that as part of this day. And I thought, what a benefit we have as Christians. Because we have a God that isn't saying, just go find some random meaningful thing to do. No, I am going to show you meaning. In fact, I'm going to call you to very specific tasks and meaning. And I want you to go after it. But I'm going to show you. And as we were talking last week, God goes through an amazing process to get us to the point to hear him on this. Uh, we, we talked about the, the great reversal last week, where our achievements, the things we're trying to do well, those sometimes come to the end of their, their useful life and, and turn out to be meaningless and useless. And God often will take things like suffering and removing our pride to get us to the point where we truly understand that what we have confidence in is, is Jesus' salvation and his work in our life and, and just loving him. And somehow in that, it all works together. He says, uh, Philippians 3.12, not that I've already obtained all this or I've already arrived at my goal. We're in process in this great discovery. In fact, I had several people come up to me this week after we talked last week and said, I've had things that I, I truly um, were either gifts or, or talents that I had that the Lord had me set aside for a season and, and put at rest uh, until he, he could show me how to use them for his purposes. And sometimes God just does that. He, he works out something. Uh, but the, the thing that, that just that I got out of, out of this whole we day rah-rah event for the kids was it's not just finding that meaningful thing that's there. It's finding the meaningful thing that has its origin in God. That is what is important. And that, and that encompasses all of life. So the great pursuit we're going to talk about today is also part of the great reversal we talked about last week. It's this inner work that God is doing in us. And here's the big idea I want us to take home today. It's I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. What a great thing to wake up in the morning and say, or to pray. Lord, I don't know what the day is going to look like. I don't know what's going to happen, what you're going to bring into my life today. But I want to take hold of that for which you have taken hold of me with all my heart. Paul says, I pursue this. And it's fascinating when you look at the change in his life. You remember last week we talked about Paul and one of his great boasts was that he persecuted the church. If you look at the original language, he actually says, I pursued the church to persecute it. He had missed, misplaced uh, priorities. He was searching for meaning in the wrong place. And God turned him around completely. And now what was he doing? Well, he was pursuing the church. But he was pursuing the church to build up the church now. God had completely changed his, his focus and completely changed his direction. And now he was striving toward that goal with all haste. It was a great pursuit. So what we want to do is to find the meaningful thing that God has placed in us and have it work. Now, I, I gave this quite a bit of thought the last year and a half because some very interesting things happened to me where contacts or, or circumstances or experiences from my past came to play a major part in 
what I do right now. And, and you know me that my great interest in life is missions. It's the thing I wake up thinking about quite a bit. And especially how do we involve uh, ourselves in, in the meaningful things God wants us to do specifically, the things he's revealed to our church to do. Not just the good things, there's lots of good things to choose from, but what is it that God really wants for us as a church to do in the area of missions? I think about this all the time, and I don't know where, as a person who leads in this area, to necessarily help people to go, because I know there's a lot of great choices out there. Well, the thing that God did in the last year and a half with me is he kept bringing up these people that were from my past, and he would like you know, that would come to my attention. It started with Global Media Outreach a year and a half ago, where we became aware of this ministry you could share your faith on the internet. Well, it turns out that the person who started it was my old boss several years ago, who retired from his position and gave me his job as missions pastor at the church in California I worked, and went on to start Global Media Outreach. I probably wouldn't have paid attention to that at all had it not been for him. I might have let that opportunity just go right on by. There's lots of great opportunities. But because I became aware that he started it and that there was something to do, I, I went ahead and, and, and pursued it, and we started to do it as a church. Same thing with Perspectives class, which we ran a couple years ago. We're going to run it again in January. I, I've been through that class three times. It's been a great blessing to my life, and we brought it here because, mainly because of that. But it was something God had done and planted in me years ago. The... The recent ministry we're doing in Southeast Asia started when I was right out of college working as an engineer in that country and then getting to know a few people over the years who, who came into my life again just recently and now we're going for that as a, as a church. There's no accident in all this. God planted these things a long time ago. And I began to think of calling a little bit different than we usually do. And it's something very simple. I want you to it's as simple as your cell phone, if you have a cell phone. If you don't have a cell phone, look at someone who has a cell phone. <laughs> but a cell phone is really interesting. A cell phone goes off, and you have it with you, and you're usually doing something else, and it interrupts you, right? And, and what happens is, if, you're, if you have a little screen on your phone, which most people do, it has a little name on there, and you decide at the moment it rings whether to answer or to let it just go to voicemail and do something else with it, or ignore it. You can ignore or you can answer. And, and the name comes up. So when this thing goes off, it bothers you, it disturbs you, you got to make a decision, because you're doing something you think is important at the time. You're talking to somebody, you're doing this, you're doing that, and you're interrupted. You look at the screen, and, oh, it's my wife. Better answer it. Good thing to do. Or husband. Better, good thing to do. Or, or, stranger still, it's an old friend, someone I haven't talked to for two or three years, but like two years ago, I put their name in my cell phone, and I have their contact in there, and I haven't talked to them, and they've just called me. Oh, wow, I should talk to them. But if, it, if you don't know who it is, you let it go. You ignore it. And I think God will guide us and show us, oftentimes, by bringing up that familiar thing. He'll remind us of it, and he'll even interrupt us in the midst of great things we're doing to call us to something specific. So I want you to be aware of that. that. And this is, again, I take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. He's already taken hold of me through all kinds of experiences in my past, and, and the things that he's calling me to now, those interruptions that I might not even want to really do anything with right this minute, are worth doing because he's brought them up. So pay attention when that happens, because that's, how I think, how God works. I mean, I wouldn't answer my phone if I didn't know who it was. I surely would go on with what I'm doing. And God wants to get our attention. He wants to show us meaning. Now, how, how do we get into this idea? There's a couple of things about the goal that Paul brings out that are really important. And the first of them is that the goal in its pursuit does not originate with us. Now, we know from... Ephesians 2 talks about this. It says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is one of the first verses I learned when I was a brand new Christian. In fact, I had Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 as a memory card. 
and I remembered it. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one can boast. And that's all it said. And I had my memory card, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and I understood that I was saved by faith. That's such an important thing. Saved by faith in Jesus, and I don't have to do anything to be saved. Wow, what a great truth. Problem was, no one gave me verse 10 for a long time. That's the next part. It says, for we are his workmanship, or his, his, uh, his, yeah, his workmanship created for good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And this thing about good works shows up in verse 10, and, and, it, and maybe it's a little confusing to have, you don't need good works to be saved, but he has good works for you to do. And people thought, well, maybe we shouldn't teach both because it's confusing. It's there because it's a paradox. It's there because he took hold of me, so I take hold of him. They're both important. They both work together. And it's such an intrinsic truth that even people that aren't Christians often get it. There was a a number of books written on success and leadership. And a fellow named Jerry uh, Jerry Porras wrote a book called Built to Last about business leaders. Great uh, successes in companies. He, he, he had written that book and he decided, I'm going to go back and, and interview some of these business leaders that have gone on to do great philanthropic work in the world, have solved mal- the problem in, of malaria, or have gone on to found organizations which do great good. And I'm going to try to find out what drives them, what motivates them to do all these things. Well, what he found out, it may be a little astounding, because here are people that aren't, some of them aren't believers. What he writes is this, These people that do this have the audacity to embrace the idea that they, either alone or with the help of a creator, are building this life for a reason rather than life being something that happens to them while they are are making other plans. They are finding that life is not random. In fact, another person writes, real leaders were born to do what they are doing. They may not have known what they were doing when they were young, but there's an inner guidance system that makes them perfect for their time and unmet needs of their culture. So something's planted in them. These are people that don't even necessarily understand the Bible, but they have seen it, and they can't deny that life has purpose and meaning, especially when God directs you to something like this. Well, we have the great benefit as Christians of having the Bible tell us this over and over and over again. That God is at work in us. It doesn't originate from us. The goal doesn't originate, and the works don't originate from us. They are planted, they are, they are inspired, they are empowered by God. And we just grasp on and we participate with them. So that's the first great insight, great thing to keep in your, your toolbox of worldview. Second thing is, the goal is completed over time. Paul says, I don't consider myself to have taken hold of it yet. He, it's a lifetime. You ever heard God uh, isn't finished with me yet? <laughs> it's a lifetime. In fact, uh, another verse, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That's my life verse. I had that read at my wedding. And I've had that as a, something that I've held on to. He who began a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Often when we think about these particular kinds of verses, we think of ourselves, and God's not, like I said, God's not finished with me yet. Uh, he's doing things in me to work on my character, on my moral life, on my relationship with Jesus. And we think of a lot about ourselves. But I want to show you something here that is even more remarkable. See, Paul, when he wrote this, he who began a good work in you, he's talking to the church, not just one person. But he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Well, when is that? We don't know, of course. We don't know. But is it here yet? No. The day of Christ Jesus is coming. It's when Jesus comes back again. He is is doing something through us in history and in the great plan of the world. And you get an inkling of this when you look at Hebrews. You ever, ever read Hebrews uh, 11, the, the great hallmark, uh, all the history of faith and all the different people who had faith? 
Well, here's what it says right at the end of Hebrews 11, as they've gone through all these different people who had faith and, and played a part in God's plan. He says, all these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us so they, they would not reach perfection without us. See, this completion that he's talking about, this perfection that he's talking about involves all of us and some role that we play in the great cosmos of history. It's way beyond us. It could never originate with us. But it's part of it. When I taught church history the last few months, this became like stereo to me. As I looked at the lives of men and women who, by just faithful work, started a seed of revival or started a seed that, that went on from them that, that carried over. I mean, you look at Jesus. Here's one person, a few followers, and now they're, we're in the year 2013 with billions of people who believe in him. How did that happen? But you've got people like Athanasius, way back in 300, who, as a monk, fought against heresy, stood up and said, no, this is the truth about God. And then he, as a side, uh, as a hobby, decided to list the, the books of the New Testament that are in our Bibles today, and everybody agreed with him. Here's one person that changed everything for us. 300 A.D., Augustine, very sinful man. God gets a hold of his life. He writes City of God and many other theological books that helped, helped us to understand God. St. Patrick, a man who was kidnapped as a, as a child, taken to, to Ireland, escaped, came back to England, and God called him back, and he was the one who, was the one who, who brought the gospel to Ireland. Boniface and Leova brought the gospel to the Germans. There were these Waldesian preachers who were told, don't preach. But they said, we have to preach because the word of God says we have to preach. So they did without permission. You got Francis of Assisi, minister to the poor. Thomas Aquinas, who defended the faith. John Wycliffe, who risked his life to translate the Bible into English. John Huss in Bohemia, who gave his life to make a protest. Joan of Arc, who fought a war. Erasmus. Here's a fellow. We don't hear much about Erasmus. You know what he did? He took Greek texts. He's a kind of a scholarly guy off in the middle of nowhere. He took all the Greek texts and he decided, decided, let's print those on the Gutenberg Press and make them available for everybody. You know what happened then? Everything changed again. The Bible was translated into all kinds of languages. The Reformation started because of Erasmus. And we're just up to 1,500, folks. We haven't even covered up to now. But all of these people were part of that. It took time. It took all kinds of, of contributions, some of them known and most of them unknown that established who we are today and why we're even here today. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus, and we're part of that plan. You ever seen the movie City Slickers? It's an old movie with Billy Crystal and Jack Palance. There's a, a scene in that movie, and it's about one thing I do. Paul said that right here. One thing I do, and he starts talking about it. And in that movie, they're out on this cattle run. And Jack says, you know what the secret of life is? It's one thing. Just one thing. You stick to that. And then he goes on in some cowboy language. Actually, he quotes the Apostle Paul. I don't know if you know that, but he quotes the Apostle Paul. He says, everything else is just dung. That's what we talked about last week. All the achievements are garbage. They're dung. He kind of got Paul right, actually. I was surprised. So Billy Crystal says, well, that's great. But what is it? What is the one thing? 
Jack holds up his finger. That's what you got to figure out. <laughs> leaves, leaves poor uh, Billy Crystal hanging there. But we have a God who doesn't leave us hanging. He is actively helping us to figure it out. And here's the one thing Paul says I do. He says, this goal requires my action. Forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. In Philippians 2, it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. We all make conscious choices every single day. And when we hear the word of God and respond to it, we are making a conscious choice, either to ignore it or, or to follow what God is, is telling us to do. What is a mystery, though, is the motives behind our choices. We really don't know what are the real and final motives for anything we do. We have a lot of things we think about. We have our, our human will. We have God's leading in our life. We have our circumstances. We've got temptations. We have Satan even maybe whispering in our ears. We have uh, how we feel that day. There's a lot of things in our, in our motives that are a mystery. In fact, it says in the Bible, only God knows the heart. And, and we don't really all know all the reasons why we choose. But here's this. Paul says, I press on for the goal. Keeps his eyes fixed on Jesus. And he uses this example of a race. And I really like how this, this example fits with this. Because you ever run in a race before? You sign up for the race because you think it's a great goal. It's either I'm going to compete against some other people and do my best, or I'm going to finish this 5K run, or whatever it is. And you sign up for the race and you start it. And as you get into the race, what happens? You get a cramp. You're running. People are passing you. And the first thought is, why did I sign up for this race? <laughs> but you're not thinking, no, the goal is worth it. I remember I did this goal. Uh, I know they said when I signed up it was going to be a fun run, but it's not. But I'm still going to finish the race because I have my eyes fixed on the goal. And that's how Paul looks at it. He says, the goal is out there. Fix your eyes on the goal and run with faithful action. And I will take care of the cramps and the competition and the hard parts. You just make the right choice and go for the goal. There's a man named William Carey back in the 1700s. He was a shoemaker. He was interested in, in uh, travel. He'd read books on travel. And he was reading the Bible. And I don't know what all his motives were, but he came to the conclusion that, that the church should really go off to places that didn't have the gospel yet and tell them about the gospel. He got so convinced of it, he went to a prayer meeting, and he stood up and said, we need to go. It's, the, it's our duty. It's our commission to go. The Bible says it. <clears throat> An elder in that church stood up and said, Sit down, young man. If God wants to reach those people, he will do it without your help or mine. Now, William Carey didn't listen because he had the word of God to hear instead of that guy. And he understood that, that I take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And he raised the money to go when he went to India. And God empowered his ministry and started the missionary movement. Another drop in the sand, another seed planted because he had listened and he had responded and he had kept his eye on the goal and he had no idea how he was going to get there, but God provided for him. And that is the walk that we take. Now I want to conclude here with a few thoughts on what the goal is consisting of. <coughs> This can be more of a theoretical exercise for many of us. We think, oh, the goal is Jesus, and that's it. But Paul has several things that he says, put your time and energy into. And if you read the Bible carefully, especially all of Paul's letters, there are a number of areas of life, daily areas of life, that when we apply ourselves and, and follow God's call, he will work. So these are the clear will of God, and I'm going to talk about four of them because they help me. You know, when I get up in the morning and I want to pray that prayer, Lord, I want to take hold of that for which you've taken hold of me. These are the things I want to pray about. 
First one is strengthen hearts. It is God's will for us to have strength in hearts. He has a verse here in 1 Thessalonians, May he strengthen your hearts that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. He wants us to grow closer to him. He wants us to, to focus on love and focus on good things and, and, and avoid evil. And he wants to help us grow as people. That's, that's, that is his goal for us, to make those choices each and every day, to strengthen our hearts. Now, close to this is the second one. Loving families. No other better way to test your heart than to be in a family. That's what I always say. Because the minute you're praying all these wonderful prayers about love and seeking God, what do you have? A family problem. Or an issue to face. Or someone who says, uh, you know, what are you doing? And here's what Paul says. Each of you should also love his wife as he loves himself. The wife must respect her husband. Don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Don't exasperate your children. What if the children exasperate you? I mean, what do you... These are tests. You know, the family's a great testing ground. And, and I, I wrote this primarily for me. I don't know if it helps you. But I'm the kind of person who has big ideas and thinks about other things. And oftentimes what God reminds me to do is to get out of my own head and just to love my family. To say a nice word to my wife. To hug my kids. That's the most important thing of the day. That's God's will for me today. That's taking hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. We know that many people that aspire to great things, oftentimes they're tripped up because the other two are not in a good place. Inner life is a mess, family's a mess, and they're tripped up. So these two are really foundational. And then the third one is growing together with others. Paul talks so much about this, I had to put it in. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And again, this is another challenge. These are all challenge areas. Because in church, the easiest thing to do is to come and leave. Come, listen, leave. <clears throat> Some people just want to even just forget that and just listen on the internet. They don't even want to come and be with people. But God calls us to each other. God calls us to be with other people, and, he, and, and he's no, there's no a accident that there's problems with that, that we don't get along with certain people. But he calls us, be in a small group, be together with others, serve together, and work out your differences. Grow together with others. So here's another thing that I've been praying. First of all, Lord, you know, strengthen my heart. I really need it. Help me to love my family and find love in my family. And third, help me to be available whatever happens with the body of Christ as they come into my attention span today. Because you're going to run into somebody, another believer. What are you going to do? And has God called you to be a certain way or to give a word of encouragement to that person that interrupted you, just like the cell phone? But there's an importance there because he's bringing it up in our lives. So we work all those things out. And fourthly, we become a light to the world. It says here, do, do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault and a warped and crooked generation so that you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Those first three areas all build together to make us lights. And, and dealing with the grumbling and arguing is really dealing with growing together with others. But when we have all those three things happening, we, we become lights to the world. It's much better to be a light to the world than just a loud mouth. I'll tell you that. Much better. God wants the, the, the word and the message we have to, to emanate from all the parts of our life. And, they, and it has an effect because God is at work in us, in the world. So the conclusion, and I love the conclusion of this little part of scripture. He says, all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we've already attained. All of us who get it, who are mature, should take a view of, the, of this. That is to pursue that for which God has pursued in me. But I love that he says, if you see this differently, God will make it clear to you. You know why that's funny? Because you know how many, how many sermons there are on these four topics I just mentioned? How many different ways of looking at it that we have? 
Your whole life, if you've been in church, has been a reminder of these important things. And God wants us to hear it in so many different ways, over and over again, that this is the good work I am doing in you. And I want you to respond to it with all of your strength and action and, and keep your eyes focused on the goal. And his concluding words here are, only let us live up to what we've already attained. What that means is God's put it in you. Don't neglect it. Whatever he's planted in you, grab hold of it. Take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of you, and you will find God's will. So let's pray. Father, you promise in your word that you have taken hold of our lives. And as I even think through some of these things, Lord, I pray that you would strengthen our hearts, that you would help us to love in our families, and that you would help us to grow with others so that we can be lights to the world. Lord, you knew all the specifics, you knew all the circumstances, you know our weaknesses, we are in process, and yet we are part of a great process that you are doing, not only through us individually, but corporately together. So Lord, help us to grab hold of that, to be part of what you have done and what you are doing, and to gain understanding of your will for us. Because as we give our best, you are giving your best to us. Thank you, Lord, that you don't leave us searching for meaning, grasping for meaning, but you have come and you have called us and you have interrupted us, and if we're paying attention, you're going to make it very, very clear to us. You've set us apart. You've given us roles to play until the day of Christ Jesus. And what a wonderful thing it is to walk in that and be empowered by you. Lord, I pray for each that we would apply ourselves that we would not leave off that verse 10 and just rely on verse 9 and 8 of Ephesians 2, that we would know that we are saved by grace and through faith, and it's the gift of God, but we are also your workmanship who is created for good works, which God has prepared in advance. So thank you for that promise. Guide us as we pursue you. In Jesus' name, amen.